around this summer loft and I thought, you know, I could, I could maybe do a show around this. That's Hero, Hero on the back. And you probably can't see the caption, so I've blown it up for you. There he is, tiny fucker, but I'll tell you. Chase your dreams, but what I would say, like if I was you, I've obviously been there and done it, and set your ambitions really, really low. <laughs> Shitter for me that I find is that um, the money in the cards dwindles bit by bit, year by year, less by less. And this year, right, and I got COVID at the same time, so I should have had some kind of pity. I got five pounds in my cards for Christmas. Five paltry pounds. From a, from a lady, um, not even a family member, still puts five pounds in my card from a lady called Bernadette. Who used to cut my mum's hair? God bless her, still sends me five pounds. Even my nan has stopped putting money in my car. <laughs> <laughs> you leave your nan alone. Leave Nanny Dogs alone! Why do you invite family to the show? <laughs> she used to give me 20 pounds, but what you'll find, you all know, you get kids. The kids start getting the money instead, and she goes, well, I'll stop giving you the money now. That was 20 guaranteed pounds. We, we had words today. <laughs> 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 I said, Nan, even Bernadette still gives me five pounds. Oh, my God. She was like, who's Bernadette? I said, exactly. <laughs> but no, she, she's great, my Nan. She's, uh, she was 90 last year. 19 Yay! years old, still going strong, and unusually for an old person, she's not racist in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> and you've got to admire that. Admire that. <laughs> I mean, to be fair to him, and I loved him very, very much. Um, God rest his soul, my granddad was racist enough for both of them, so. Uh, <laughs> It was just a generational thing. Very, very funny man, but, uh, but, <laughs> but I started thinking about because I was I was got five five pound. I had nothing to do. I but started thinking about what my best presents were, either for birthdays or for Christmas. And uh, I think my favourite birthday, and then it was my worst birthday, and then it was my favourite birthday again. It was my sixteenth birthday, right? Because I got I think I got I think what was the best present that I think I've ever had. And it was, uh, it was this. BMX Rally Burner Bike, a posh one, you're right, sir. I think this is valued at £1,300 on eBay now. If, if, if I, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. And, uh, and I, so I got this for my 16th birthday, so all of a sudden I was mobile. I was from an area called Holly Hall in Dudley. Uh, so I ventured over for the first time into enemy territory. <laughs> The People's Republic of Penn's Net. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't get very far on my new bike into the People's. I got just past Russell's All Hospital. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> I, came, I came across a teenage Asian lad who uh, hit me around the head with a tennis racket and stole my rally burner bike. <laughs> I mean, he did offer me his horse in exchange, but uh, you know, it's right. It's, uh, <laughs> and I've never seen him or the bike since. It's just just disappeared. And uh, but you know, 
swings and roundabouts, you know, you've got to look at the positives, because when I was walking home, I found a porno in a bush. <laughs> I'd never have spotted that if I'd have been whizzing past on the road. Uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, my dad wasn't very impressed when I got home and told him I'd lost the rally burner, but uh, he soon perked up when I showed him the copy of Big Tops. <laughs> Actual magazine. I haven't, I haven't still got the rally burner, but I've got the magazine. I found when I was 16. That, that's currently worth two pounds seventy-five. Um, big. T I love, I love the strap line. You wanted big boobs, and you got it. And I wanted to ride down on my bike, but that's another story. Um, and you, and you got the lovely Rhonda. Uh, I don't know if they have balloons or breasts that she's displaying there. And I always wondered um, about the pose. Right? I looked at this magazine a lot and I thought... <laughs> I thought, what is she doing there? And I wondered if the photographer had got there and he's like, what are we going to do? Rhonda's like, what are we going to do today? So like, we'll try something different. I've got a book of Sunday League football stretches. Let's try the hamstring. Uh... <laughs> there was like heel flicks and all sorts uh, that, that came after that. But... Uh, but I've gone way off being worried. What's the show about? Well, three or four years ago, I found this up in my mum and dad's loft. Yay! Give me a cheer if you know what it is. Yay! Give me a cheer if you don't. Yay! Could be a long go for you guys. Um, <laughs> the whole show is about this. <laughs> nah, you'll, you'll like it, you'll like it. It's uh, a national record of achievement. So in the... 1990s, the government spent millions and millions and millions of pounds so that every school kid could have one of these to put all their folders, certificates, achievements in. And then when we left school, we could take it for an interview and get a job working nights at Tesco Burn Tree. <laughs> Living the dream. Living the dream. And the problem with them was, is that there was too many plastic wallets in there to fill. You'll see from this. There's a dilemma that we had as kids. It was like, do we put the achievements in there that deserve to go in there and take a folder to an interview that has got three certificates in it and 27 empty plastic wallets? Or do you do what I did and just fill it with any old piece of shit that you could lay your hands on? And just go to an interview with 18 empty plastic wallets? Um, and so I found this, I found this up my loft and I thought, you know, I could, I could maybe do a show around this. So I, thought, I was head boy when I was at school. Bex will confirm that. I was head boy. I was tipped for a bright future. Uh, in, my, in my leaving book, my form tutor said, the world is your oyster. That's what she wrote in there. 25 years later, three career changes later, that oyster's never really stretched any further than Telford. <laughs> So it's been, it's been a record of underachievement, hence, hence the title of the show. A um, lot of bright starts in things that fizzle out very quickly. Bad things happen. Um, and so I thought, like I said, I thought I'll make a show of it and we'll, we'll look at some of the things in here. And if you're uh, sitting comfortably, we'll begin. We had to write, uh, for those of you who have them, you know we had to write a personal statement in the front, which was our own handwriting. We had to try and sell ourselves in one side of A4. The people that were going to look at it, and uh, <laughs> I'll just read you an extract from mine. Right, in year nine, I completed my Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award. I struggled at first, but I was the happiest man alive. <laughs> I was the happiest man alive when I received my award. So wanker, I won. And you're probably thinking, happiest man alive? I don't think so, I know. Well, have a look at this then. <laughs> and 
if you, you're probably looking at that and thinking, is it, is it, it, it is Hair uh, by Bernadette. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that five pound is compensation, it's not a gift of any kind. Um, I don't know if you know who the lady is who's presenting me with, with the award. Big, big name from the 1990s is, of course, Nightshade from Gladiators. I mean, you, you saw how happy I was. Imagine if it had been Jet. I mean, I'll be honest with you guys, I put all of these slides together myself a few months ago. And I have no idea why there's a picture of my head in the right hand corner of that. Uh, <laughs> looking absolutely delighted with myself. It looks like I'm having a seedy FaceTime call with Jet about 25 years before FaceTime was even invented. <coughs> I'm like, ooh, Diane, put your old suit on and get your pugil stick out. <laughs> yes, her name is Diane, doesn't quite sound so sexy now, does it? I remember, uh, actually, what I was, <laughs> was going to do was. I was going to try and turn the head that way so it looked like I was lying down and then it would look like the pugil stick was my cock that was the original thing <laughs> behind it but, but it, it didn't work so I just, just gave up and I was just left that there um, but as part of the Duke of, Duke of Edinburgh award we had, to, um, we had to do first aid which is obviously a good thing to put in a record of achievement you know, you can help out when you're, uh, when you're required to in a, in a working environment. And there's my youth first aid certificate. The eagle-eyed and munch will notice that perhaps not so useful considering it expired 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and roughly about six months after I left school, so absolutely useless. Um, and I had to hope that they wouldn't probe further into this record of achievement and look at the actual Duke of Edinburgh logbook, because this was the actual assessment from the first days. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of subjects that you can probably get away with being quite good at. <laughs> Like German, you could probably still find your way to the local swimming pool, you know, being quite good. Quite good at first aid. <laughs> Somebody's probably going to die. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing was, I got the certificate, you've seen it, quite good was good enough. Um, <laughs> I'll, go back to the, uh, I'll go back to the personal statement. Um, I wanted to do my Silver Duke of Edinburgh Award in Year 10 but felt that I would not have enough time to give it my all. <laughs> I hope to complete it later in life when I have the time to put 100% effort in. I mean, I was 15 years old. What was I doing that was taking up... <laughs> Uh, it was harder in those days, though. <laughs> <laughs> I just realised that has a double meaning. That was really intended. Uh, I mean, very true. But, uh, <laughs> but it's harder to get hold of Cliff, you same kind of age. Harder to get hold of the materials to, to stimulate us as young men. Not as many bushes these days, but we don't, we don't need bushes. We don't need bushes nowadays, either on the women or on the internet. Because young people now, and there isn't a young person in here, but they've got a fucking smorgasbord of porn now that they can access. Red Tube, Pornhub, all these websites that I've never ever been on. <laughs> Didn't have that in my day. Didn't even have the internet. Didn't even have mobile phones. Didn't have nothing. We did. We didn't. Oh, I had a mobile phone. <laughs> we did. Okay. <laughs> Shot coming cut that bit out. So. <laughs> <laughs> What 
what was your best part of the show, Wayne? Well, it was when the girl I went to school with questioned whether mobile phones were around in 1996. <laughs> we had a good chat about it and then agreed that I was right all along. <laughs> <laughs> I was making was that before, before my 16th birthday in the era that I like to describe as PBT, pre-big tops. <laughs> the only thing I had to titillate me was Samantha Fox strip poker on the Commodore 64. Which, if you remember the Commodore 64? Graphics, really shit graphic. You you remember this centre tape deck? No CDs, just press play. There's the loading screen. Shift and run stop. Hope you don't get a syntax error. And then, then the magic happened. Forty-five minutes it used to do that for, roughly on average, just going up, up and down, up and down. I mean, uh, my mate Azim, he used to come round and play computer games with me quite regularly. I mean, obviously not when Grandad was there. <laughs> Glass normally smashes at that point in the show where he's going, you fucker, you fucker. Um, but he, as he, God bless him, he was, uh, he was epileptic. So he was, he was always touch and go with those stripes, whether when they finish, when the game loaded, whether he'd be ready to play or on the floor. It was too difficult to, uh, The, like I say, the graphics were shit, so it would load up eventually, and Sam Fox would appear, looking more like a blind Sam Allardyce. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> and the worst thing was, I had no idea how to play poker, right? <laughs> And there's no YouTube, no way of getting tutorials, no way to learn. So it took me three weeks just to get a scarf off. <laughs> do, you see, uh, do you want to see Sam with a scarf off? Yay! There you go. <laughs> That's Sam Allardyce, by the way, if you don't know. You don't know. That was unappreciated, really. That took me fucking two days to put that out. <laughs> but, uh, but we went uh, on to the contents of my uh, magical job securing folder. Um, what I put front and centre for some bizarre reason um, was this one a skiing certificate. <laughs> I mean, unless I was going for a job at Tamworth Snowdown, probably not a great deal of use. But it was in there, right? And, it, and you can see, it's in Catalan, it's not even in English, so it's fucking useless. Um, well, I'll translate it for you. It says, uh, School of Ski, Ski School Diploma, awarded to Wei Yu B. <laughs> Must do a name in Catalan or something, I don't know. Uh, for completing the ski course from 15th to 19th of January 1995 and excelling in snowplow turns. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I didn't just get that certificate for, uh, for completing the slalom, I also got this. <laughs> Woo! I like to wear it whenever I get it out, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> ski, ski metal rock. Ski. I mean, we're all friends, so I'll be honest with you. 
I wasn't awarded this for, uh, for, for getting the certificate. Um, I, we, there was a slalom on the last day, right? Slalom race, and uh, I'd been shit all week. I was sharking the instructor, right? I was crashing into things, I was falling over. I looked terrible, right? And behind the teacher's backs, I said to the instructor the day before the slalom, I said, I bet you 2,000 pesetas I'll win that fucking slalom race. And he went, you've got no chance, you're on. What he didn't know is I've been training at Tamworth Snowdown for three months in the run-up to the holiday. <laughs> and I, uh, I smashed it and uh, didn't get this medal for winning it, but um, with the Pesetas that I won, I bought it for the ski. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's equal in my view. It's, uh, it's <laughs> But we went, it, the ski stiffic comes, we went to Andorra for a week when we were in year 10. Um, and it was the first trip I'd ever been on abroad without my parents, and it was fucking crazy, right? The kids were all drinking, there was parties going in the rooms, people were jumping balconies. Um, I can't tell you for legal reasons where the booze was coming from, but I can give you an anagram. Driver, coach. <laughs> You can get it from that, you cleverer. <laughs> and uh, but I didn't get involved with it because, like I said, I was head boy. Um, you know, I, I, I had obviously a reputation to uphold. So, and I was rooming with two Muslim lads. So I was rooming with um, Wakar and Azim, Azim from the, the Sam Fox days, right? So, so I didn't drink for for all the week. But then it got to the last night, and I thought, Billy Big Bollocks, I've won the slalom. I've got my medal. <laughs> Got some pesetas in my pocket once I bought the medal. Uh, I was like, I'm going to go and get myself some beer. I'm going to have a drink on the last night. And I went out with a rucksack, brought back four San Miguel's to the room. <laughs> Hadn't really drunk up until this point. So after two San Miguel's, I was absolutely shit-faced. <laughs> and Wakar and Azim, of course, weren't drinking. So they were trying to go to sleep. And I was like being a bit of a dickhead and playing them up. And Azim said, right, ne next, next thing you do, I'm going to tell the fucking teachers. I've had enough. And uh, so I stopped for a bit and then I went for a piss. And there was like a clear run from down the corridor from the toilet to where Azim was lying in bed. And, uh, and I thought he doesn't want to go to sleep. He wants to play WWF wrestling with me. <laughs> and so I raced along this thing and just landed the best elbow drop you've ever seen on him while he was asleep. And he, he shot out of bed and through the door and he was down the corridor and he was off towards the teachers and I thought, Shh. And my life just flashed before me because I, I can't lie about it because I've still got two cans of beer in the room. The room gets searched. I've fucking got there. I'm caught red-handed. He's going to go to the teacher. The teacher's going to come and find it. I'll get sent home in disgrace. My parents will find out. I'll lose the head boy badge. They'll probably take this medal off me even though I bought it myself. <laughs> And I thought, I, can't, I was in a position of power, I thought, I can't have that happen, I've got to stop him somehow, I've got to stop him. But he was going further and further into the distance, so I needed, my first thought was, I was still in wrestling mode, I thought I could run really fast and deliver like a flying drop kick to him from behind and take him down, but I was really pissed and there was no way I was going to catch him, so, so I needed like a long range weapon. And uh, I looked round and I just couldn't, there's nothing that I could see, and then, uh, and then I spotted this. <laughs> Just flick the light, switch on and off for a little bit. teacher and I, I made sure the teacher was there when I, I got back to Azim because um, because we'd grown up together so I knew how to, to bring him back round so I quite effectively like I, I saved his life you know <laughs> it, 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 it says quite good at first day in that book right? I mean actually I was fucking brilliant at first day but 
But I found out in life that if you show that you're really good at something, people just want you to do it more and more and more. And you end up working far harder than you have to. So just pretend to be shit is my... Uh... So I brought him back round and, uh, you know, it's... Uh... <laughs> Things to turn out sometimes. That's Hero. Hero on the back. Same for Lyle. Same for Lyle. Same for Lyle. Same for Lyle. I love, I love the fact, the thing I love the most about this sticking is the mystery <laughs> epilepsy attack. <laughs> you might think that's enough. That's enough, Wayne, right? But what I did was, I said, uh, Sir, I think I know how this has happened, you know. I said, yeah, he's been drinking. <laughs> I've told him not to, with his condition, I've told him not to, but you can't tell the lad, can you? I said, so there's still two pounds in the room if you want to go to the <laughs> Me and Azim don't talk anymore. <laughs> but the first place I, um, so, so I left school, Got, got good grades, survived the crisis, um, got good grades, left school. Uh, and the first place I took this record of achievement to was, um, was a factory in Pensnet for an interview for a summer job. You can imagine um, how it might look with a 16-year-old lad wearing his dad's suit. <laughs> carrying this under his arm, walking through a factory for an interview. It's fair to say I was a target. <laughs> oh shit, I've missed one. Oh, hang on a minute. Well, we'll, we'll come back to that. My, uh, my favourite certificate in this folder, um, just, just do this very quickly before I go back to the factory. This is my favourite certificate in the whole folder, right? And it's a 100% attendance certificate that I've got. Um, and, and I think this is worthy for being in a folder because it shows to an employer that I'm going to turn up, which is surely crucial. Unfortunately for me, that black tape bit isn't how it appears in the folder. This is how it appears in the folder. <laughs> Shows I'm going to turn up for two weeks of every year before we break up for six. So, you know, it's... how did we think we were going to fucking get away with that? So, in, uh... so yeah, so I'm, so I'm in the factory. I've taken this to the factory. I'm walking through the factory in my dad's suit with this under my arm. And every work workstation I walk past, I get a different heckle. Oi, green suit wanker! This is what I look like, by the way, if you need a visualisation. <laughs> That's the exact suit that I was wearing. Got to the next workstation. Oi, clipboard wanker! It's a folder, mate, what are you on about? <laughs> And then I got to the last one, and I'd never seen a person like this before in my life, right? He'd got a big, massive, bulbous eyes and one tooth, right? One tooth. And my granddad always used to say to me, never trust anyone with more eyes than teeth. <laughs> Good advice, I've found over the years. No, no, he didn't say that. No, no, no. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. So I'm, I'm scared of this guy, right? Fucking 
crying to death. He's got right up in my face. And he's looking me up and down and he's realised that all the insults have gone. So he just looks up and down and he goes, You're just a fucking wanker! <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, mate. Yeah, yeah, it's fine, yeah. But is there anybody work in a factory? Hey! <laughs> fair play, fair play. Hard job, hardest job I've ever done. Monotonous work, long work. Um, but there's some great characters in the factory that I worked in. There's, uh, there's a guy called Stu, and to give you an idea of the level of banter in this factory, Stu's nickname was Irish. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he was from Tipton. <laughs> But they, they all had like food based nicknames, so like there was a guy there called Richard and they, they called him Spotted. <laughs> <laughs> and we had, a, we had a lady there that they called uh, Tirima <laughs> Salata, lovely Indian lady. <laughs> Possibly my favourite thing on the show, I'm glad you liked it everyone. <laughs> Kind of guy, there's, there's one in every factory. I've worked in a few of them. Uh, walk, walk around like he hadn't got enough room in the cock and ball department, so he walked around like this. I don't know about this guy. And uh, his main job at the factory was to walk around telling people how many women he was shagging at that particular point in his life. Um, that's all he seemed to do. So, like, I got him one day, six o'clock. I was like, You're right, Irish. <laughs> He's like, Nah. Nah, clipboard wanker, eh? Hey, all right. I haven't even got it then. I can fucking knackered. It's like you've only been in five minutes, Stuart. How can you be knackered? You're shagging all night, eh? Hey? And he got, apparently, he got four women on the go. He got like Mandy on a Monday, Debbie on a Tuesday, Wendy on a Wednesday, Brenda on a Friday. Thursday was his night off, bit of me time. <laughs> <laughs> Not like that, he was fucking knackered. I mean, the boy did... Crystal Maze and Chippy, that was what he did. Watch Crystal Maze and a Chippy. Give me a cheer from him the Crystal Maze. Yay! On to the medieval zone. I mean, he was in the medieval zone on Friday as well because Brenda was 64. But... <laughs> He didn't give a shit. Give a shit. Yeah. But I, I, so I got to the interview, and, uh, and there's a guy called uh, a guy called Roger who did the interview, and uh, and he was like he spoke with a downturned mouth, old guy, really miserable guy, strange guy, and uh, and spoiler alert, I got the job. Right? But he was he was he was tough, the tough interview. He picked up the record with him, he was going through it, and he got to uh, he got to this certificate and took particular umbrage with this one. Um, it says, uh, Wayne Bees, who was a member of Bees's Barmy Army. <laughs> I mean, captain, actually, but uh, let's not split hairs. Who were crown champions of the 1994 Holly Hall Indoor Cricket League. And he got to this bit in the folder, he's like, Wayne, this is for a fucking job in a factory. What relevance do you think this has to that? I was like, come on, Roger. It shows I'm a winner, don't it? He was like, Wayne, you just met one eyed Trevor here and there. He lives in a caravan in Kidderminster. There's no winners here, son. <laughs> Sorry, Roger. I don't, you know, I, I really want this job. I fucking didn't. But, um, I really want this job. Like, what, what, what do I need to do to, to kind of fit in? You so we can fucking take them medals off from around your neck for a start. I didn't there. 
Um, but I didn't, I didn't stay working in factories. Um, I, uh, I ended up becoming a journalist. Yeah, trained to become a journalist. Um, I wrote in my record of achievement that it was my ambition to become a journalist uh, and to work for a big paper like the Daily Telegraph. I don't know if I meant like a big paper or just like a really big paper. But, um, it was huge back then. Um, and I wrote, um, I wrote I'm, I'm doing my work experience at the Dudley News so I can find out a bit more about what it's like. Because they're exactly the same, aren't they? The Daily Telegraph and the Dudley News. Um, but, uh, but I got a job as a journalist and, uh, and like most of my life it started off really, really well. Like within six months I'd become chief reporter, I was absolutely flying. Um, a lot of people were tipping me to end up working for a red top in Fleet Street and stuff like that. Got promoted again very quickly, became a news editor, so I was in control of running the paper, designing the paper, subbing the paper, getting it all out. Things were going really, really well, right? And then what happens always happens, I got a bit bored. <laughs> I got a bit lazy, got a bit sloppy, um, and started making mistakes. And mistakes are costly for newspapers, especially if you make fucking big ones like I did. Um, <laughs> 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 I'll show you this before I tell you the first mistake I made. But this, this is a classic QWERTY keyboard layout. I want to alert you to the fact that I is next to O and K is next to L. Um, I, was, I, was, um, I was news editor for um, South Shropshire Journal in Ludlow, so I was designing the front page this week um, and I, the front page picture was a group of bell ringers, <laughs> because that's about the best and the most interesting thing that ever fucking happened was in Ludlow. And, uh, and it, we were right on deadline so we were really rushed so I had to really bang it out quite quickly. And there's a saying that they have in journalism and the saying is never become the story, right? We got a call from the uh, Bell Tower captain the day after we went to print um, to point out a mistake that had been made. Um, and then the main trade website for journalism hold the front page, ran this story. Free sheet record after pit caption blunder. Hundreds of copies of a free weekly newspaper had to record last Friday after a misspelled picture caption left staff red-faced. Last week's Ludlow Journal featured a front page picture story about a bell tower captain called Tony Fuller. Remember the QWERTY keyboard layout? We <laughs> <laughs> would organise the training event for young would be bell ringers. Again, I wish this black tower bit was there in reality. Unfortunately, the picture caption rendered the name Tony Fuller as Tiny Fucker. <laughs> that staff at the paper were alerted to the error on Friday by Mr Fuller himself. <laughs> and you, you're probably thinking, well, you could have made that up, man. You could have just drafted that up. But well, I've got the actual fucking story. Um, I mean, there he is. <laughs> There's nothing tiny about Tony at all. He's fucking massive. I mean, you're wondering why those kids look so terrified. It's because when Tony pulls his fucking rope, they're going up, and they're going up a long way. And you probably can't see the caption, so I've blown it up for you. There he is, Tony fucker, Bell Tower Captain. If you're in journalism, and there's a couple of lads in here who are used to work in journalism, well, you'll also spot that I've, spot, I've spelt the name of the photographer wrong as well, which just went under the radar. You can understand, considering, uh, bearing in mind the error. Uh, they had to recall 13,000 copies of the, uh, of the newspaper. Um, I suddenly became a li less, bit less popular. I'd say it was about as popular as Sue Gray when she turns up at number 10 eventually. Um, and I got, I got moved out of the office, right? I just got sent out to cover court. I just didn't want me fucking in there, they just shipped me out. And uh, 
And again, it can be costly covering court if you make mistakes. Um, I was on a downward spiral by this stage. I got sent, it wasn't even Crown Court, it was Magistrates Court, right, which are the really minor cases. So I'd gone in a few months from kind of running a newspaper and being involved in all the major decisions to writing about people stealing cheese from Aldi. Um, <laughs> And it was shit, and my heart wasn't in it, you know, I was, I was fucking too much for that shit. Um, and I got sent out to cover a case one day, and it was a, it was a, it was a case of a, of a wheelchair-bound man who'd been, who'd been accused of growing drugs in his house, right? My, my, you know, minor drugs, can, cannabis as it's called nowadays. Um, and I was in a rush, I'd been at court all day, just wanted to get home, so um, I, I rushed my intro, which said... Uh, a disabled man, accused of growing drugs in his home, has today walked free from the <laughs> Second paragraph. Barry Jackson, comma, who has no legs, comma. <laughs> Just a term we use, so I just didn't, I was in pi autopilot, I just did it without thinking, and I mean, I should have spotted it on the subs desk. I'd like to say I would have spotted it, but you've seen how bad I am at subbing. Um, and uh, it got worse because, like, the next day, um, Barry Jackson himself phoned up the office to complain because the uh, DWP had been in touch and stopped his benefits. <laughs> Uh, and it got worse again because my colleagues and I had to field about 50 calls from disabled people who wanted to know where Barry Jackson lived to find out more about the miracle cure. Um, so my popularity waned a little bit further um, and I was then shipped out from Telford head office to Ludlow to work as a reporter. Right? Uh, six months before, I'd been running the fucking paper there, and now I was a reporter writing the shit stories that came out of Ludlow. <laughs> nothing happens there. It's a lovely town, and nothing happens there, right? The, be the best call I received while I was there was a guy who phoned up and said, you need to send a photographer down here, mate. So, oh, why? We've got a giant lizard in the middle of the road. <laughs> And we were so short of stuff, I was like, that is an absolute nailed on front page picture there. And I was like, mate, is it definitely giant though? Because we had a tiny fucker on there last week. <laughs> working in Ludlow, 80 mile kind of round trip every day on lethal country roads and everything else, sitting on my own for large chunks of time in an office with nothing to fucking do. And it was at that point in 2013 when I started doing stand-up comedy, like nearly nine years ago now. And uh, I, was, I just thought, second career change, hopefully, I just thought if I can work hard at it and, and get good at it, you know, maybe, maybe, who knows what might happen. Eight years time, you might be standing in front of a hundred people in Stourbridge. <laughs> <laughs> you told me that then, I would not have believed you. <laughs> <laughs> and while that was on, that, while that journey was ongoing, um, my third career change happened in 2017. And to give you an idea of how well the comedy has gone since 2013. I'm still doing that job uh, now. But in all seriousness, I'm dead grateful for the job that I've got. And I have to say that because my boss is sitting at the back of the room. <laughs> but no, I am genuinely, because like in March 2020, the pandemic hit, um, and I'd still got a full-time job. And like loads and loads of my colleagues, full-time comedians, had their diaries and their, their income just completely wiped out overnight, tragically. When I say tragically, tragically for the ones I like. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you the organisation I work for now because I want to keep the job and I think there's probably some kind of thing that I've signed that I'm not allowed to talk about them on stage. But again, I can give you a clue, there's a bit of a legal loophole. It's a council. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
And if, you, if you're Wordle fans, you'll probably get that quite easily. <laughs> but, yeah. but even though, like, uh, even though I had a job, I had an income, I still lost all my income from comedy, which was fairly sizable, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, so it was tough. It was tough financially, it was tough mentally. We were all cooped up inside. We had to fucking homeschool our kids. Which, if you had to do that, how tough was that? I say it got tough financially for us. Like one of the biggest lessons that I taught my kids in those early days was that uh, Mars now equals Titan. <laughs> Stickers now equals racer. <laughs> and the most important one, Desperados now equals El Bandido. <laughs> that was for uh, that was for both of us, me and the kids. After the first week, we were both on the, uh, both on the El Bandido. But, uh, but yeah, lock, lockdown lockdown was tough. I think it was tough for all of us. But what what I love about this country is that. Um, Whenever there's moments of gloom, people always appear. Like really positive stories always come out, and they just break that gloom for a little bit. That's what Britain's all about. And uh, and we had some heroes of lockdown. I mean, who can forget this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Captain Sir Tom Wolfe, 99 year old war veteran who just took to his walking stick, walked around his garden lots and lots of time, raised millions and millions of pounds for an absolute hero. Just lifted the nation for a couple of weeks. Jackie Weaver. I mean, before before the pandemic, none of us had a fucking clue what Zoom was. I just thought it was going really fast on a rally burner. But so all of a sudden, we were all on Zoom. And personalities appeared. Jackie Weaver, the Paris Council clerk. My favourite Zoom personality was the American lawyer who had to try and convince the judge that he wasn't a cat he left the filter on. Um, Rod, Rod Ponton. Um, I had a legal issue over lockdown that I needed some help with, so I phoned up Rod Ponton's office to see if he could help. And I spoke to his PA and said, uh, you know, it's, it's Rod Ponton there. And she said, oh, we, he's not here. We haven't seen him since last night. He hasn't come back yet. One of my favourite jokes. <laughs> um, but with all, with the greatest of respect to all of those, uh, all these amazing people, um, my most memorable moment of lockdown wasn't any of those. It was um, a, a Tuesday night, cold Tuesday night in January last year, when uh, my in-laws, for the first time, ordered a takeaway on Uber Eats. <laughs> Incredible scenes. Lo lovely people. Jan and Alex, but two of the biggest technophobes that you will ever see, right? And of course, they were forced, Alex Main, who was forced onto online shopping and everything within a few weeks of the pandemic hitting. And within two weeks after that, he was banned by both Argos and Screwfix. <laughs> <laughs> Angry man. <laughs> Angry man. And he's got, um, he's got online banking, but the only bank account details he's got are mine. Right? He won't add anyone else's bank account details to it, so when he wants Nick to order him something, my wife, he'll send the money through to me. When he wants something from Screwfix, he can't get it himself anymore. He'll send the money through to me, and then I have to send it on to Nick, and then she has to make the purchase. We're basically running a money laundering operation. <laughs> to fund his screw habit. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy, but like... Somehow, on this, you know, on this January, the, the algorithm must have gone wrong somewhere because somehow an email dropped into Alex's uh, inbox from Uber Eats offering him 50% off a takeaway. Right? So he phoned Nick up, he was like, Nick, Nick, can we use this for the chippy in Ben's net? And she was like, yeah, of course you can. We can't, can we? Like, yeah, of course you can. Will you order it for us then? And so we had this rigmarole where Nick was on her iPad on FaceTime to them and she was showing them through the iPad her phone and it was through her phone, through the iPad, through FaceTime that for the first time uh, my father-in-law saw the Uber Eats map. And, uh, and he said, well, what are you showing me a map for? I know where the chip is, don't show me that. 
And what's, what's that bicycle next to it? What's that there for? <laughs> she was like, well, that's, that's Mohammed, that is, that's your driver. He said, I'm bringing our fish and chips on a fucking bicycle. <laughs> it's 3.4 miles away, it's stone cold, but Nick just can't, I don't want it anymore, I just can't sleep again. I mean, us Uber Eats regulars know. Nick said to him basically, you know, it's, it's just a picture, it's probably a car or a moped. We know sometimes it is a bicycle. But that wasn't the time or place to raise that with him at all. Uh, <laughs> so, we said, so we said, it won't be a car, it might be fine, don't worry. And, uh, and Alex is the kind of guy, you'll all know a person like this, is the kind of guy who thinks he knows the best and quickest route to any given point in the world. Right? No matter where you say, he knows the quickest route. So he's following this map, he's fucking loving it, right? He's fucking loving it. So the, the bike goes off, and uh, he's going, so he started going, he's going, just cancel it, just can't cancel it. Like, Whoa! Mohammed's on the move, the bike's moving! Jan! Jan, get in here! <laughs> Jan comes running in, she's like, what the bloody hell's going on? Who's Mohammed? He's our driver, and look at him racing down the Pensnet Road, he's not on a fucking bicycle, come on son! Come to daddy! <laughs> and he's following him down the road, right, and he's coming, it's coming to the end of the road to a T-junction, right? So he's following him, he's like, Jan, Nick, watch this, he's going to get left at the end of here. Can you watch him? He's going to turn left. Where the fucking hell is he going? <laughs> he's going the long way. He's going to charge us more for this, Nick. What's going on? He's like, Dad, he said, if we drive out a taxi driver, we'll be the same price. Just don't worry. And Mohammed got there eventually to their house, and uh, Alex answered the door to him. They exchanged the food. As Mohammed was walking off, Alex said, Hang on a bit, Mohammed, son. I've got a tip for you. <laughs> <laughs> never seen this man tip cash in my life, so I'm intrigued at this point as to what's going to happen. Uh, he disappears inside, comes back out with an A to Z. <laughs> He's like, Mohammed, come and have a look at this, son. You've gone the long way to the mountain today. We need to have a chat about this. <laughs> and he came back inside. We are still on the FaceTime. He came back in with his chips and his fish. And he's like, Nick. He was on a bicycle, you know, I don't know. He's got down here so quick, fair play to him. And I perked up at this point, I said, it wasn't a fucking rally burner, was it? <laughs> so, coming to the end of the show, it's a show about achievements, right? Um, so I kind of considered what, what does achievement mean, like I've been doing comedy, as I say, nearly nine years. Um, what have I achieved in comedy? How do we measure achievement? Where am I in the pecking order? Um, and to give you an idea, before we even start this, the first time I ever did this show was at Birmingham Comedy Festival in October last year. And this is the flyer for Birmingham Comedy Festival, and I've ringed where I appear on the pecking order in that programme. <laughs> Two things I'll point out to you that angered me very slightly. Um, there's a Scottish sock puppet theatre that appears above me. <laughs> which is bad enough. But there's also fucking Buster Keaton who died in 1966. What is going on? Crazy. But, how, how do we, like I say, how do we measure success? Right? How, do, how do I measure success? How can we discuss how successful I am as a stand-up comedian? Well, so, social media now is massive, right? Online presence, Facebook followers, Twitter fans, Instagram, that's all massive. So we can consider my Facebook following, which is the main thing that I use. This is my Facebook page. Um, 1,117 people like this. I mean, I don't know, do you think that's impressive? Yay! It's not bad, it, you know, I've not been on TV, it's not bad, you know, 100 odd, 100 odd followers a year, take that. One review, you'll see. <laughs> Five stars. <laughs> I, can, I, can, 
can show you that review. Um, just makes you laugh. That's what you want. <laughs> I am the stand-up comedy equivalent of Ron Seal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, do what it says on the team. That's, that's, from, that's from a big fan of mine, Rob Padgett. Uh, big, big fan of mine. Uh, hasn't bought a ticket to any of these shows. Uh, um, so one, one thing we do in comedy, I think in all the arts is, uh, and to be honest, in life really, we, we always compare ourselves to others, like people who started at the same time as us. We look at bills that people appear on, we look at people that appear on TV, how the fuck have they gone on there? And you get bitter very quickly, it's not a good thing to do, but like I wrote this section of the show at two o'clock in the morning after I'd drunk about eight pints. And, uh, <laughs> And so I started looking around Facebook for things to compare myself with, to see how I was doing. And uh, I found this ginger cunt. Station cat. Uh, 9,952 people like this, including 34 of your fucking friends. What are you doing? What are you doing? It's a cat. It's a cat. I'm also alert to the fact that Georgia Stavish Station cat has got 41 reviews. All at five stars. So of course, what did I do? I had a look through the reviews. <laughs> Always gives perfect information. <laughs> Fuck off, Keith. <laughs> Such an inspiration with his words and thoughts. Yes, aye, that is the correct response. Maria's fucking drugged off her tits. What's she talking about? wonder what kind of world I'm living in. Um, and so I was shaking my head a lot and drinking and then I came across this one. George saved my life from a gang of angry ninjas. <laughs> and the weird thing about this, these are all genuinely true, so if you go on George's page, these, I haven't made these up, they're genuinely true. And the weird thing about it is, is that I noticed when I was looking through all these reviews that there was either a like or a love response on all of them. And I thought initially, ah, oh, George being a cunt, he's just liking all his reviews, isn't he? Uh, but he wasn't, right? It wasn't him. The only one that he's liked is the ninja's one. Which tells me that it fucking happened, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So I concluded, uh, I concluded Facebook probably wasn't for me at this stage and uh, I thought I'd have a look at Ents24, right, which is like a live entertainment website that lists events. You can go on and follow your favourite comedians and acts and when they announce shows you'll get an email notification. So I had a look at like um, some acts that we had last summer, some big name acts. So we had Rich Hall, 4,000, great act, 4,680 users tracking, Henning, Henning Vane. 4,025 users tracking. <coughs> what about Wayne Bees? <laughs> 13 <laughs> users tracking. <laughs> I love the fact that I'm not really puzzled about the fact I've got so few followers. Um, the worst thing about this is, is that I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I am one of those 13 people. <laughs> because I get email notifications every time I announce to show myself. Um, so, so I concluded uh, I concluded after this, um, at half past two in the morning, that social media doesn't matter really all that much. Um, so what else is that? I mean, like you'd probably all say TV is a good branch of success. If you appear on TV as a comedian, that's a good, a good measure, a good yardstick that you made it in the industry. And I, I wouldn't disagree with that, you know, but what I would say is, 
we shouldn't just leave it at live at the Apollo and mock the week and all those kind of things. What about uh, countdown to murder? <laughs> <laughs> Five star. What about that? What about killer in my village? On the crime and investigation network. You should consider these TV appearances as well. Uh, I did that. Uh, I covered a court case based around the journalist and wrote a background which is still online. So whenever they make a TV program about this case, I always get an email saying, "Will you be on TV?" and uh, and the last time they approached me was during lockdown, and I said, uh, I, said I, don't, I don't do that kind of stuff anymore, I'm a comedian now. And uh, she said, oh, it's uh, 150 quid. I said, yeah, I mean, let's do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> and uh, and well, when I did them, I thought, because any, any TV credit is a good credit, you know, I thought, it should be good. <laughs> Comedy. But the thing I found is, like, on posters, it looks good if you like, as seen on Live at the Apollo, star of Mock the Week. <laughs> like a promoter found out to his cost that it's not so good really if you put uh, Star of Killer in My Village on a poster. <laughs> Especially if the picture you used to accompany is this one. Um, <laughs> because they thought, that, uh, they thought that I was the killer in the village. And, uh, and no, <laughs> no one turned up to the gig. But, um, a TV, yeah, not important. So let's look at it because it's weird, right? Because despite the fact that I've got a tenth of the followers of a cat, <laughs> and despite the fact that I could fit all of my Ents 24 followers onto the Nemesis with me at Alton Towers, I still have 22 spare seats. <laughs> Despite the fact I've got no TV credits at all to mention, somehow, somehow, I've sold nearly 500 tickets for this show. And and I don't take that lightly at all. I'm so grateful to everyone who's come out to it. Um, this was an extra date, so I didn't know how many we were getting, and this is the most we've ever had. So. You know, it's absolutely, and I don't underestimate it like so because a couple of years ago I put I booked two acts who just appeared on Live at the Apollo to do separate gigs for me in Dudley, and they didn't sell a single ticket between them. They've been on Live at the Apollo, so so to get the numbers that we've had is absolutely amazing. And uh, but on the same, on the flip side of it, I also know in my heart of hearts that this is probably as good as it's going to get for me. Um, it's all right you guys saying no, but what you don't know is, is that I'm doing this show at Leicester Comedy Festival on Thursday and I haven't sold a single ticket. So, uh, <laughs> and when I say this is as good as it's going to get, it's as good as it's going to fucking get. So, I'm going to be performing this show to a barman next week. Uh, <laughs> if I'm lucky, they might not even put any staff on it, I wouldn't blame them. Um, <laughs> TV is not going to happen for me in terms of comedy because I'm not in the right place. If I, whether I was good enough or not, I'm not in the right places for people to see me. Don't gig in London. Don't never done Edinburgh. Not really considered going to Edinburgh. And uh, even though this is one of the best comedy rooms in the fucking country, they're not in the habit of rushing up here to see uh, see what's going on in Stowbridge. So, so you know, it, it ain't going to happen. Like TV is not going to happen. Um, the only other way into it would really be comedy competitions. Um, but the problem is I'm cripplingly bad at comedy competitions and I go out in the first round of every comedy competition I enter. The last one I entered was the uh, Love Honey. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely true. Love Honey um, Bath Comedy Festival New Act of the Year competition. Because there's a strange thing in comedy where you can enter a New Act competition when you've been going for seven years. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I entered it because I thought, I'm a, I'm a PR man, I've come from journalism, this is a fucking marketing dream come true. Wayne Bees, love honey. <laughs> <laughs> the headline writes itself. Bees buzzing because he wins love honey bath comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a shoo-in for this. Got knocked out in the first round. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've, I've 
I've made peace with the fact I'm not going to be on TV, and it's been very easy to do that because oh, I've got no wish to be famous at all. Um, I, I would hate to be, anyone who knows me, I would hate to be, not be able to walk down the street without strangers stopping me and trying to talk to me. I mean, fucking hell, I don't like stopping to talk to people that I do know. <laughs> I've avoided many a person that I've caught the eye on. Uh, kids behind all sorts. So I just wouldn't be able to, I know I wouldn't be able to handle that. I wouldn't be able to handle it. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't know how the top, top boys cope. Like, you know, imagine Peter Kay. Every time he goes out for a minute. Do you want some garlic bread, Peter? Some garlic bread? I'm in an Indian, mate. What are you fucking talking about? Mickey Flanagan. Every time he leaves the house. You going out, Mickey, or you going uh, out, out? Sean Walsh. Fucking stay away from my wife, son. <laughs> no, don't tell him I said that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd hate it. Like, you know, I'd ha stuff that for a game of cards. I still want to go to Birmingham and have two for one cocktails on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. That's, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Um, and 25 years ago, which I think was the year I left school with this record of achievement. 26. 26. Ah. It's good that I've got a factual heckler in the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> I paid for this film to go out on Netflix with inaccuracies. Um, <laughs> well, thanks, Bex. Um, 26 years ago, um, I met one of my heroes. Right? I met one of my heroes in Asta at Merry Hill. It's a guy called uh, John DeWolf, right? the Wolf's, Wolf's yeah. defender yeah. at the time. And uh, I didn't meet him in Alstrip, I met him down Merry Hill, he was in the queue waiting for an ice cream. And, uh, and I said to my mate, I was with my mate who wasn't a football fan, I asked John DeWolf that is, I said, uh, we were just pottering about down there. I said, uh, so I'm going to go over and talk to him. I said, you probably go home if you want, we're going to be chatting for ages. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I went over to him and I said, uh, and I said are you John DeWolf? <laughs> and he basically, we had a really awkward one and a half minute conversation where he just answered one word answers, was not interested in the slightest in anything I had to say. And I just had to scuttle off back to my friend who basically stayed right there because he knew what was going to happen. Um, and I thought, if I, you know, if I ever get any kind of fame at all, like, I'm not going to treat anyone who comes up to me like that, who, you know, just wants to talk to me. And uh, last summer, um, I, had, uh, had, I was in Asta at Merry Hill the day after I'd done a show with Nina Conti at Barney Hill Civic. And uh, this guy came up to me in the, in the crisp style <laughs> while I was having a little spring um, <laughs> And, he, <laughs> and he, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, uh, he said, are you Wayne Bees? <laughs> <laughs> nah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I get that all the time, I must look just like him. I said, have you, have you seen one of his comedy shows, have you? He's like, no, nah, he was on a murder programme I watched last night. <laughs> 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 and been recognised uh, in the street and anywhere far, far more for appearing on two murder programmes <laughs> than I ever have for my stand-up comedy. Um, the score in that particular match, if you wouldn't, is 1-0. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great tackle. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but like for, for much of my life, as the show title says, it has been a record of underachievement, uh, without a doubt, and you, you've heard about some examples of that. But like in comedy, uh, genuinely, it's been, I've overachieved, like without a shadow of a doubt, because the only thing I ever wanted to do in comedy was to do it. Like my first thought of doing stand-up comedy was 10 years before I actually did it, before I actually braved the you know, to get up on the stage. Bex will know, she knows me, but there's been loads of people. I was really shy, still a really shy lad, really introverted. Not the kind of thing I would do at all, and when people heard that I was doing it, they were fucking shocked, believe me. Um, but, uh, but I was determined to do it, and like in, in uh, May, nine, May 2013, at the Hollybush pub in Cradley, I finally fucking did it. I got up on stage, I realised my ambition, and I did stand-up comedy for the first time. 
Do it on my ass. <laughs> but uh, but what the, the key thing was like I um, why did I put it off for ten years? Well, I was scared of what people would think. Um, why did I do it eventually? Because I was sitting in a chair in Ludlow with my life just rotting away. Um, <laughs> in a job that I hated. <laughs> and I thought like I had, I had two young daughters. And I thought, I can't, I can't logically go back to them uh, from this job and say, chase your dreams when I'm just sitting in a job that I hate and I'm just going nowhere with. And, uh, and I didn't want to be in a rocking chair in my 70s, going back and forth, going, you should have tried that, you might have been all right, hadn't you? Uh, I didn't want those regrets and I wanted to be a role model to my kids. And so, so, so I went for it and I did it. And, uh, and I suppose this, if there's a message from this show, um, Maybe the message is chase your dreams. If there's something you want to do, go out there and do it. And, and I wanted to finish it in a really positive way. Uh, and my initial thought was that I'll finish it with a song. <laughs> Took the day off when I found that picture on the Instagram. <laughs> So, so the moral, I guess, what do I want to say to you guys is, chase your ambitions, chase your dreams. But what I would say, like if I was you, I've obviously been there and done it, and set your ambitions really, really low. <laughs> be my advice, uh, it's less work, it's less work to tick the box and, uh, you, know, and you, you still get there, you still get there, aim for the, yeah, aim for the stars. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a job, but when I started it was a hobby and it was a passion and I fucking loved it and, and over time it's the same as anything, it becomes a job and uh, and it's the same as any job that's hard. The highs and lows are worse. There's massive highs and there's massive lows. And mentally, it can be very tough. And like Annie, my youngest, said to me a few weeks ago, Dad, do you think you'll be doing this, uh, this comedy in your 60s? And I said, no fucking way. Uh, <laughs> because it's too much up and down. It's too much up and down. So, um, so hopefully I'll know the time to get out of it. Between us guys, in October last year, I was ready to quit. I was supporting Johnny Cole on tour. Um, to give you an idea how much goes into this show, um, there's, I think there's 9,000 words written for this show that go, went into the show. There's 15,000 words that I chucked away that I thought that weren't good enough. Uh, most of those 15,000 words I performed in support for Johnny Cole in October. <laughs> <laughs> Whose audiences told me in no uncertain terms that they were shit. Um, so it was tough October, like I, I, my heart wasn't in it, I wasn't getting much back from the audiences that obviously just come to see him. Uh, and I thought I'd had enough, like, and I thought I've got, I've got a lot of gigs to the end of the year, I'll do those. Uh, and then I'll just pack it in and call it a day, I've had a good run in it, um, let's do it. And uh, luckily I got a holiday booked in in October, October half term to go away. Thought I need a break and uh, so we went away to Haven in Devon. Caravan Park, and there was uh, there was me, Nick. There was our two kids. There was our dog. There was Alex and Jan. There was Stephen and Kelly, Nick's brother and sister-in-law. There was their screaming baby who screamed for most of the week. <laughs> and we were all in one caravan. In <laughs> and I came back after that week, and I thought, you know what, comedy's probably not that bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm back, baby. I'm back on the train. <laughs> and uh, I'd echo what I said. If there's, if there's anything that you want to do, so literally, because honestly, anyone who knows me, I'm the last person that would be doing this. If there's anything you want to do, we've seen the last two years. Life's too short. Fucking get out and do it. And. Uh, and I, and I started doing something else because I thought, like, as I thought comedy was at the end for me. So I started learning a new skill that I thought I could maybe do this when comedy finishes. And uh, I've been wanting to do it for years and just never got round to it. And uh, so I started learning and mucking about. And uh, 
Turns out I'm actually quite good at it. Hey! decision but uh, guys you've been uh, absolutely fantastic yeah, this has probably been my best night in comedy so far so thank you for being because you're all here for being a massive massive part of that. Uh, and uh, the bar's staying open so feel free to I'll stay for a drink if you want to stay for a chat and everything please feel free to do so this has been my uh, record of achievement and I've been Wayne B so thank you for coming out thank you for listening.